Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. So this episode might be kind of all over the place, given some of the scattered ambience and stuff I'm trying to get through in my back catalog. Only a few really big name releases, but hey, some weeks that happens. Let's get on the pulse. So before we go any further, if you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be extremely grateful, especially for episodes like this that are not remotely guaranteed to get that much exposure. I'd love to see this get a little bit more traction in the algorithm. Maybe share it around, leave comments, that'd be great to see. But anyway, we got eight projects on the docket. Let's start off with from the Nashville Ambient Ensemble, Light and Space. So this is an act I was actually planning to cover back in 2021, but simply ran out of time, where a group of session musicians improvise misty country tones into analog ambient music, and their debut Cerulean was really damn pretty. So now back with this, well, there's been a shift towards more gauzy digital synths, more squealing fiddle alongside the pedal steel, and even more whispered vocals, even fully formed lyrics. But wow, there's a few nice touches that remind me a bit of Casualties of Cool and the guitar textures, the fiddle they sound terrific, but the buttery mix doesn't feel as organic as it could with both the runny but hollow synthwave keyboards and the vocal blending, where its improvisational compositions can set up a borderline dream pop atmosphere, but lose a bit of character in some of those standout moments. I mean, it's good, it's got a couple nice spots, I'm just less impressed this time. From Grand Brothers, Late Reflections. Okay, the German ambient duo are back after All the Unknown in 2021, one of the best projects of that year, with this album that takes their glassy, fast-paced, tinkling piano arpeggios for a more nocturnal sound, recorded in the Cologne Cathedral with the inclusion of organ and perhaps their most intricate percussion to date. And that interlacing patter with the haunted natural reverb of the location, along with some occasional quaking shudders of glitch, it creates this cavernous mysticism to their post-rock inspirations, long shadows dancing across stained glass windows. Now, there are a couple shorter pieces that feel less like transitions, more like unfinished flourishes, and there are some tones and percussion that get a little bit too brittle, but the tighter sequencing and starting a little darker allows their melodies to pop all the brighter. It's legit beautiful work. Please check this out. Might be their best to date. From Temple's Exotico. So let's ask, what was Temple's greatest strength? If you answered dreamy, throwback, but irresistible melodies and harmonies, you would be right. So naturally, the band went to Dave Fridman's mixing, which increasingly blows out all the bass lines and percussion, and Sean Lennon on production, which washes out all the sound for a more tropical vibe, but sucks all the immediacy out of the band on an album that runs painfully long, turning them into a wannabe tame impala with a splash of King Gizzard's environmentalist streak and trying to ride out this apocalypse amidst a meandering party and nature and hookups. So very late 60s in that. So yes, it might be heavier overall. And there are a couple songs where great hooks will punch through. But as Temples have also never really had lyrics to quite match the melodies, some of this band's maximalist aesthetic got kind of grating. And as a whole, I don't think it sticks. So yeah, unfortunately, it's a really big disappointment for me. Hit and miss at best. From Karen Jonas... The Restless. So yeah, I'm later than I want to be to Karen Jonas's newest album, which some have said is her best since 2016's Country Songs. Hell, I've been listening to this off and on for damn near two months. And you know what? I do think it's a pretty great album. Jonas dials into a soft-spoken, smoky vibe that cultivates a lot of mature sensuality amazingly well. With a more cosmopolitan, European vibe to her framing, it's a really nice touch to showcase some heady, lived-in romantic details, especially as the production feels a little more more burnished and robust. I do have some minor nitpicks. I don't always love some of the backing vocals, but where this took a long time for me to really click comes with the greatest strength also being its greatest weakness. It's a very slow burn. You need to have patience to let it sit and simmer. It's definitely a very adult album in the framing and subject matter, but at least for me, that's a win. This is her best since her debut. Great stuff. From August D, D-Day. So I guess since I've covered other BTS side ventures before, folks thought I'd be open to Suga, aka August D's full-length debut, and yet, 
While there's talent and polish here, the production's pretty well balanced, August D is a competent rapper, the album runs at a very brisk pace and doesn't overstay its welcome, it also sounds like a mid to late 2010s pop rap album with some truly egregious auto-tuning where the selling points are really that it's from a member of BTS with a collab from the late Ryuichi Sakamoto of Yellow Magic Orchestra. Outside of that, there's more swagger balanced out with some lonely, jaded bitterness, some dabbling in trap, drill, and R&B where the direct influences are very obvious, and lyrics that, while I am sure I'm losing something in the translation, just feel very broadly sketched, undercooked, and honestly derivative. I mean, it's passable, it's fine, but it's really hard to recommend to anyone outside the BTS army. I just didn't find it that interesting. From Enter Shikari, A Kiss for the Whole World. Look, even the fans will admit that Enter Shikari, as a band, makes wildly overproduced, genre-bending, messy albums where you just have to pray for the hyper-earnest, transcendent moments. And when many of the fans were calling this messier than most, my expectations were mixed, and for good reason. Now, thematically, it kind of makes sense. This album is about existential confusion and rage, seeking inspiration and freedom with lots of reckless abandon. But outside of some passing jabs at social media, the lack of specifics lends to a lot of broad sloganeering that feels kind of aimless and fragmented. And that's true about the compositions as well, flailing between post-hardcore, over-compressed pop metal, even some bro-step in electronica, where if the momentum or tempo flags at all, all that impact evaporates. And yes, of course there's going to be a few potent moments, but this is more of a firework than a bonfire. Extremely hit and miss at best. From The National, first two pages of Frankenstein. Stein. Look, The National are near the elder statesman role in indie rock, where the albums are going to be good or on the cusp of great, but not going to match their peak. I believe that since at least I am easy to find. Now this feels a little tighter, a little softer, and more pop friendly, the lyrics a bit more direct, and even if Sufjan Stevens and Phoebe Bridgers feel like glorified backing vocalists, they are welcome here, and Taylor Swift is a great counterweight to Matt Berenger. That being said, it is a National album, the melancholic tones are very familiar, the bass and percussion could afford to hit a little bit harder. It is a slow burn and that doesn't always help the melodies pop, but the ones that do deepen the feverish, complicated, but emotive relationship drama, they're just gonna crush you underfoot. Tropic Morning News, in particular, one of the, my favorite songs of 2023. You'll know what you're getting with this. At least for me though, I'd still call it great. From Jack Harlow, Jackman. So after Jack Harlow's mainstream failure to launch last year, the calculated pivot isn't as surprising for me as it seems like for everyone else. Like Drake after Thank Me Later, go for rougher, more soulful beats, focus on the bars to win back old fans, build up hip-hop cred, take those extra chances we're always so willing to give white rappers, low risk, high reward. But given that I didn't hate his last album, I'm way less impressed with this. The defensiveness clashes with Harlow's laid-back cool, the family in insecurities and has come up there explored, but the introspection's kind of flimsy. And while the serious subject matter and tone creates a heavier vibe, compared to his influences, the insight's kind of limited, the whack lines stand out way more, and look, Jack Harlow's not always the best messenger to sell this. Yes, the production, the flows, they're solid. This is decent, if way too short, but if Jack Harlow wants to jump to a higher level, this ain't a slam dunk. So yeah, once again, thank you all so very much for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be extremely grateful. Once again, share it around, leave comments. I'd be grateful for any of these compiled episodes of On The Pulse to get any sort of traction. That's always cool to see when it very rarely happens. Beyond that, though, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to potentially help get albums on my schedule beyond supporting my channel, link down there in the description for the merch. But hey, if you want to support the channel, maybe get albums on my schedule, argue with me more directly on my Discord, the link to my Patreon is right over there. Don't feel obligated. Tough times. I understand. But the option's available. Till then, I'm Mark. You're watching On The Pulse on Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.